in TV, it also serves them because it sounds like they're actually um, sharing people's voices. But really, it's because all people in Lebanon uh, are used to us just complaining, but then blaming someone else as a political system. That was very familiar to us in Eastern Europe as well. Um, it's, I think it's also a cultural thing. But to be honest, now the Western countries have this pretty much the same. And, and when you were saying that two-tier class or two-tier society, to be honest, my opinion is it's like that everywhere. It's just, it's sort of papered over or behind the curtains. But when a collapse happens, then uh, suddenly you're able to see what actually is being um, portrayed or what was happening all the time. So thank you. Something that you know, you might just, not... So, so let's go ahead with that. what you wanted to say about the, the dollars. Uh, the different dollars. Curves. I'll try yeah. to keep it simple because it's, it's really complicated and it confuses Lebanese people too. That's the, um, that's the point, I bet. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it is. So the dollar right now has multiple values. Mm. Um, the official rate is still 1,500. It's the rate that was there 30 years ago, and it's still the same. But it's a rate that is not used at all anywhere right now, except in one place, which is the um, uh, mobile sector, the mobile phones. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, that sector is priced in dollars. So when I go recharge my phone, I pay in dollars um, or in liras at 1500 and they kept that exchange rate. So really, that's pretty much it. Otherwise, everywhere else, the dollar is no longer 1500 um, The first thing that emerged was the black market dollar, which is you trying to buy dollars from someone right. at an unofficial rate. Um, that was the first thing that emerged. But then, um, as the government started adapting, a third rate emerged, and that was the 3,900, which is a little bit more than 100% of the original value. And that was a rate that's used to bail out the government from people's dollars and the banks at first. So you can take your dollars that you have not before September, uh, October 17th, uh, after. So if you had any money that you put in there after October 17th in dollars, you can take them out at 3,900 instead of 1,500. So that's when they started, you know, just absorbing the dollars. Um, and then subsidial uh, rates started emerging. So we buy everything from outside. And then as the dollar started increasing, the bread makers were angry, like, ah, bread is becoming so expensive. So the government says, okay, the dollar that goes, uh, so we subsidize the dollar for like the bakers uh, at 5,000 liras. Like they just throw numbers. Um, right. So there's the dollar that we import uh, certain items at and that's only accessible by people who work in that industry there is a price for the dollar that's used to import fuel um, there's price for the dollar that's used to send children money if you have a student so if you're a student uh, in a some other country and you want to send them your own money that you saved you can no longer use hard currency transfer um, you would need to buy new dollars, but they would give you a subsidized rate. So yeah, all different sectors and industries started lobbying for their own special treatment. And those dollars are actually set by the government, which is weird. Like the government in one place does not want to admit that the value is not 1500 anymore. Like they insist on keeping that. But at the same time, the government uh, issues a law that allows bakers to get their dollars at 5,000 rate instead of the black market, which could be 20,000 rate. So you did it's just nothing makes sense. <laughs> that exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, that's very familiar for me as well, fortunately. Oh, so you did mention riots, right? Um, and that was the spark of it. Uh, now, after that period, with all this manipulation going on and people, um, you know, having their savings uh, withered away by these uh, 
um, technicalities with the dollar and the Lebanese pound and the purchasing power? Uh, or are there any riots, riots or uh, civil unrest since then? Honestly, it's very interesting the way things happen in Lebanon. It's, it's, it's opposite from what many people um, would assume because in such conditions, mass psychology plays a role. And, um, you know, Lebanon is a culture that is used to not getting our basic needs. Even in the best of days, in the best of days, right. we never had 24-hour electricity. Um, we never had 24 hours of electricity. Like in the best cases, it would be uh, three hours of blackout every day in Beirut. And then the further you are from the uh, capital city, the more blackouts you get. And those are the good days of Lebanon. So we are used to that. People are sort of hopeful, hopeless. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. they're nothing close to hopeful. Um, Protests started and there was a lot of positive energy going on. Um, people, for the first time in many, many years, actually felt that they can make a change because mm. the numbers of people protesting was really, really high. But it feels like in the last two years, Lebanon had drawn a really, really bad uh, deck of cards because... In addition to the economic crisis, which was, you know, which was the result of all the corruption and the money of the Lebanese being misappropriated, we got COVID. And COVID um, alone, I mean, COVID alone would have really slowed down Lebanon, even if we had, right. were not yeah. uh, going through a crisis. Um, so we got COVID. And then a few months later, we got like the third biggest explosion in human yeah. history. A horrible. I remember that was just horrible. And that alone, to some people, they might think like, oh, it's a tragedy. People died. Yes. But the other side of it is the cost. That explosion um, had created losses estimated at $15 billion dollars. That's equivalent to the whole month of the Israeli war between Lebanon and Israel right. in 2006. Mm. So what got destroyed in six in in, in 33 days? Yeah. Um, that was three billion dollars. That explosion alone um, had 15 billion dollars in losses, and people had no money. The government had no money. Um, a lot of people never even fix things that they need to fix. Mm. Um, and add to that all these sectarian problems, because for the last 16, 13 months, we had no government. And it's not like we're passing through terrible times and there's actually someone trying to fix things. No, it's... <laughs> It's we're passing through terrible times, a snowball, and no one is doing anything about it. Right. Um, it's not even slowing down because um, the politicians uh, are just so uh, fixated on certain uh, sectarian powers. For 13 months, the president and the prime minister we're not agreeing on a cabinet. And that's one of the biggest problems in the makeup of Lebanon is that our politics is based on negotiation and agreement. And I mean, you can only imagine how far that would take. For two yeah. years and a half in 2015, I believe, for two years and a half, we did not have a president because they simply could not agree on a president. And again, the way we pick our president is by negotiation and agreement. <laughs> it's 20 people sitting in a room and they hate each other and they're trying to agree on one person. How to rob the country better, right? <laughs> like how do you build a country <laughs> like that? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so you touched because on, every, go ahead. Everyone wants to make sure that no one else is like too angry 
because they might flip the things. So it's always like finding the least common denominator and doing it. And that's the same reason we didn't have a government until like last week, because for a year and one month, um, they were not agreeing because um, the president wanted the Ministry of Finance and the prime minister wanted to give it to someone else. I see. Yeah. And, you know, the people are dying from hunger. <laughs> the people don't have money. We don't have medicine. Like That's what I was about to ask. Coming you, in, are you experiencing for us? And they're fighting yeah. over who gets represented. And it's not even about the person. Don't even think that I'm talking about like, oh, they want this person because they think they're better at their job. No, they want this seat be given, let's say, to a Muslim Sunni. Or they want this seat to be given to a Christian Maronite. They don't care about names. They're not fighting about names. They're fighting about sectarian representation. And everyone is dying around them. So are you experiencing food shortages? How does that play out? Can you uh, talk about that a little bit? I know electricity uh, shortages we you have. Yeah. Food shortages, food is probably one of the um, easiest problems to solve because it's a free market in Lebanon. Um, some supermarkets still um, import expensive brands because some people, a lot of Lebanese people have income in US dollars uh, because of the way the society and our culture and our finance system was built. A lot of people earn in dollars, not many, a lot. So it's not a majority by any means, probably less than 10% of the population. Um, they're still able to get their food. Um, we do have shortages on subsidized food because at a certain point, uh, the government started subsidizing specific food items. And that was the phase where um, you would go to a supermarket and there would be like 10 of this, eight of them are not subsidized. And then one of the two of them are subsidized and people would literally be fighting um, over That's these things. So people That's would shoot um, guns at each other over getting the subsidized milk. Um, it's, so it's not real shortage as much as it's really diminished purchasing power. And then people are no longer able to afford. And then the government tries to subsidize things and people start fighting over that. Um, That's the a lot worst of, part, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of common brands definitely lost a lot of uh, market. Uh, Coca-Cola went out of Lebanon very early on. So we, don't, we no longer have that. We only have Pepsi. Um, a lot of brands have um, stopped distributing uh, expensive chocolate brands, you know, all the famous international brands like Nestle, Cadbury, those became so goods expensive in yeah. Lebanon. Like, um, like a chocolate bar could be probably 5% the minimum wage. <laughs> and so that's when we started seeing all kinds of cheaper alternatives that we never had. And remember, because I, remember, I said at the beginning, the purchasing power of a dollar in Lebanon was equivalent to the purchasing power of its local equivalent, which is 1500. So the, the Lebanese market is used to upscale products. You know, you would go and find like 10 expensive good brand names and then one alternative that's for people who don't want to pay that much. Right now, it's the opposite. You go to most supermarkets and it's all sort of like new brands um, the cheaper brands, we started importing a lot from Turkey, from some Arab countries. Right. Um, and sometimes, because even, you know, when you import from any country, Turkey, you have different grades of products. And you can get the expensive Turkish chocolate and you can get the cheap Turkish chocolate. Because it's, you know, the inflation is so bad. Like, even, like, the good Turkish chocolate is still too expensive. So they get, like, the cheapest brands. And people would make jokes about them, like, oh, I got this chocolate. It's really good. It tastes like soap. Mm. Right. Because <laughs> we're not used to those sort of things. 
Um, but yeah, so people's purchasing power uh, diminished. I wouldn't say that there was a shortage in mm, food per se. Right. Yeah, but important goods pretty much went away that you would have to buy with your currency. Exactly. Um, now you, the short, you touched the on shortages interesting... were only when they were subsidizing some of them. Right. Because we also had a lot of black markets and abusers who would know that something will lose subsidies so they wouldn't sell it, so they make more profit. That's a very, very good point. And I keep making that point because um, people who are selling stuff, right, they can hold back the products. If they, they know that there's a change mm -hmm. coming, another when devaluation the coming, not they don't have to sell it. Laws, right? yeah. Well, in some countries, there's a law against that because that's monopoly. Right. And, well, there are a uh, lot of Lebanon, laws everywhere. Although in we cases. theoretically do have those laws, but needless to say, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. I don't think they so, matter too much if people are shooting over milk, you know. So exactly. regarding that, I wanted to question, like, did the crime rate go up? And is there a difference between crime rate in bigger cities and the countryside? How do or or even um, food? Um, well, I guess not shortages, but how is, uh, especially regarding crime, but other ways as well, can you compare bigger cities compared to small town or countryside um, uh, um, cities? Um, so crime rate, I, I really don't have any scientific numbers, but as, as an observant citizen, I can tell you that definitely crime rates increased. Aggression in general increased, you know, with these situations, people just get angry. Some people wait on a gas station for 16 hours to then only get 10 liters of gas. People are angry. Those people who are able to use aggression, even if it's verbal, they're using it. Um, crime rates did objectively increase. I just don't have a number. Other things that even if you would have a number, they can just write any number. I exactly. Mean, but point, you can you don't observe it. Anything, you see, it, you see observer, it on the yeah. news. You see it on Facebook, people sharing. You hear about a shooting that happened at that gas station. I mean, a few days ago, I saw like three men in machine guns, like fighting under my building with machine guns. And then that's so weird. And it's like the news said something like, oh, it was a an individual quarrel. Like, how is that? Like, if that's like right. a small problem between people. Anyway, so there is more crime rate. There is um, people who are, uh, you know, uh, stealing things. Like, I've seen people just, you know, uh, pickpocket or like grab a phone and run. Uh, because right now, if you want to buy a phone and if you earn in Lebanese liras, the cheapest phone is like six months worth of salary. Like that's the cheapest phone. And a lot of people who are, who have the tendencies to lose some of their ethics. I mean, that's, I'd rather lose, not me, but the way they think, like I'd rather live with the sin than work for six months to buy this phone. And those that's, people- yeah. just, People have a hard time understanding, especially if you think about it, right? Maybe you had six months worth of salary saved in the bank, right? What would happen with that savings now? You thought that, you, okay, if you lose your job or something happens, right? Worthless. You can live six months from that, um, mm -hmm. that uh, money that you have. And then this happens. And what could you buy with that? Right? A phone. <laughs> really, really, it became worthless. I mean, um, I, I, I can speak about my savings. I had worth of around $70,000 in savings. And that's exactly how I think because I'm a freelancer and I enjoy working uh, with my own time. So that gave me a sense of safety. Like even if I never get right. any work for the next two years, right. I can live off my savings. Mm -hmm. um, and that $70,000 right now is probably worth like $5,000. I mean, $5,000 is still a lot, but I mean, that was $70,000 at one point. Um, so that is barely enough for a couple of months right now. So there's a difference between being safe for two years and being safe for two months. Absolutely. Um, it's horrible. So do you and, use, go ahead. 
Um, another thing that uh, I, I, I thought of something I wanted to, to tell you about. Uh, I'll, if I remember it, I'll share it later. Yeah, go ahead. So do people use uh, cryptocurrencies or alternative ways uh, how to trade? Let's see what, what happened with the money in PayPal or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching this second part of the interview. There's more to come right here on the YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to be alerted about the rest of the interview. Ali is very generous uh, to share his experiences with us and there's a lot to unpack here. I will be sharing my um, own thoughts and analysis about the Lebanese situation and what I learned from uh, part one and part two of this video. Um, I will be sharing that in a members video over at buymeacoffee.com slash starpathacademy. So feel free to check it out there. Thank you very much and see you there.